On my podcast this week, The Citizen of Heaven, I was talking about bridges, and I made prominent reference to a bridge that I call the Lazarus Divas Bridge, a bridge that in fact does not exist, either in the story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 16 or any other place. As far as I'm aware of, it's named after the two principals in the story, the poor man who is named Lazarus and the rich man uh, who is traditionally named Divas, although his name does not appear anywhere in the text. Divas, of course, is translated as rich man. The bridge doesn't exist because it was never built. And we don't see it in the story because Jesus is giving us an insight into eternity. And I said there, and I'll say here as I embellish on this story a little bit, that I don't believe for a second that Jesus is trying to give us an insight into what the afterlife actually looks like. I don't think it, we're supposed to believe from this that there is actually a place on one side of a huge chasm where Abraham is comforting all of the faithful. Uh, I've never understood who was comforting Abraham, after all. He's one of the faithful ones. He should be have somebody comforting him, too, I suppose. And on the other side, there is the rich man and everyone else who is in torment, and that you can see across, or at least the the rich man can see across, and that the, the uh, poor man may or may not be able to see across, but Abraham can, it seems. I see no reason to think that that's what the afterlife looks like. If it is, then then that's fine. I'll deal with that then. I think the point is much more spiritual than that, that there is no crossing over between one and the other. You're either in the one place or in the other. That distresses the rich man, of course, because he's in torment where he is. But the whole point of the parable is that once you are on one side or the other of this chasm, there is no crossing over. And my point that I was getting at, and I'll embellish here again, is that the problem is not so much that the bridge cannot exist in the afterlife. It's that the bridge was not built in life itself. And that's what we need to be working on. I'll begin by reading in Luke chapter 16, starting in verse number 19. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you had received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed so that that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able to and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead." What a powerful message that is. And it's a shame that we get so caught up in the minutia of this story that we miss the main point. The point that there is accountability after this life is over. Whether there is a distinction between the Hadean realm that sometimes we talk about and actual eternity, heaven and hell, that's that misses the point. You can't cross over from one to the other. Once you are in torment, you're going to be in torment, the text says here. And once you are being blessed, you're going to be blessed. What a sad story, though, for the rich man. What a wonderful story, of course, for the poor man, for Lazarus. The idea that God sees us, that God acknowledges us, and that he rewards us, even if he is not rewarding us necessarily in the short term. And how tragic it is that on the other side of eternity, there is this knowledge, or at least it seems like the whole point of the story is telling us this, that there is knowledge of what might have been. And what could be in the future for others. The rich man wants to send Lazarus back to testify to his brethren. And I personally, and you can take this for what it's worth, I think that is why we get the name of this character Lazarus here. Because Jesus, as he tells this story, knows a couple of things. 
He knows that in the not too distant future, there is going to be a man named Lazarus who is in fact going to go to the other side. And contrary to virtually all expectations from the past, he is going to come back. He is going to testify. And as far as we can tell, people aren't going to necessarily believe him. Certainly the people who needed to believe him most did not believe him because we find out after Lazarus is resurrected in John chapter 11, we go on to find out that the leaders in Jerusalem are interested in killing Lazarus, sending him back where he came from, rather than listening to his testimony and acknowledging the power of Jesus that was able to bring him back from the dead to testify. And I'm sure the conversation happened. We don't have it in the scriptures, but I I can't believe this conversation did not happen. What was it? Is it real? There is blessing. There is glory for those who are faithful, if Lazarus was permitted to retain that, that memory. And of course, secondarily beyond that, and you, you can't help noticing this also, Jesus himself surely is thinking about his own resurrection and acknowledging that there are people who will send him to the grave. And then three days later, when he comes back from the grave, they still will not believe. Let's not get too caught up in the idea that if we could just see a miracle, if we could just see something remarkable from the hand of God, if he could prove that he exists, if he could prove that his word is true, then we would believe. And until then, it's the onus is on him to prove himself. And I'll just sit back and be a skeptic. There have always been people who claimed to have been open to the word of God. And once they heard the word of God and heard it in power, They rejected it anyway, just like they rejected it before it came in power. There are those who believe and there are those who do not believe. You have to decide which side of the gap you're going to be on. And the gap between those two is as profound and deep as the gap that we see in the story. There is one profound and very, very important difference, though. The gap that exists here in this life can be bridged. We can build a bridge to connect us to God, and especially as we consider the story here today, build a bridge that connects us to one another. It can be done in this life. It cannot be done in the afterlife. That is the whole point of the story here. If you want to connect with the faithful, if you want to connect with your fellow man, if you want to make meaningful relationships, if you want to be the kind of person in every way that God wants you to be, you have to do that that on this side of eternity. You cannot do that in the afterlife. So a few specific points about how exactly that works and what the bridge might look like if we were able to build it between Lazarus and Devas here in this life. We can't build it in the afterlife, but we can build it while we wait here. The bridge that we're looking at here is at its core, I think, an absence of brotherhood, or the absence of a bridge, rather, is the absence of brotherhood. We need to be busy about the task of building connections between brothers and sisters in Christ. That's done in local churches. That's done in other ways as well. The internet has been a a tremendous blessing, especially in the last couple of years for me personally, connecting with brothers and sisters in Christ over a great distance. There is the opportunity to build fellowship. There is the opportunity to connect and have real substantive relationships with people who we have not met in the flesh and perhaps never will meet in the flesh. The rich man and Lazarus had met, at least at a certain level they had met. They knew who one another are, at least. And the rich man certainly was in position to connect with Lazarus, maybe not quite so much the other way around because of social status and that sort of thing. But social status is basically done away with in Jesus. I think that's the whole point of Galatians 3, verse 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. He's not suggesting here that there are no such things as Jews and Gentiles, there's no such thing as rich people and poor people, there's no such thing as men and women. He says those distinctions, which seem so important, and perhaps at a certain level are important in this life, are not important in Jesus. Jesus loves us all. He graces us all. He blesses us all. He gives hope to us all. And there is no priority. There is no rank. There is no hierarchy among the faithful. There are different roles that are given to different people. Certainly rich people and poor people have different roles. No question about that. We find also that men and women have different roles. And that's another story that we can get to at another time. But the distinctions, especially the Jew-Gentile distinction that he's talking about in Galatians, that was so profound and seemingly impassable, has been done away with in Jesus. 
there is no need and there is no desire for us to distinguish between who belongs and who doesn't belong, who is in charge and who is following. Jesus is the only one who is in charge, and we are all subject to him. And the gap between him and us is so much more profound than anything that we might have between one another. That surely ought to create a commonality between us that is greater than any kind of social or economic or racial divide that would separate us. We should see that as a tremendous blessing. Now, perhaps if we are the ones who are being robbed, we are the ones who are being diminished to go down the social ladder, as it were, and meet somebody else, we may not see it as a blessing. James tells us in James chapter 1 that we should see it as a blessing, if only because it elevates someone who has not gotten very much status, who has not gotten very much of the world's things. People like Lazarus, for instance, we love our neighbor as ourselves, including those who do not have a great deal of the world's goods. Having an opportunity to connect with those people, to cross these boundaries that are established by societal norms, connect with them, form a brotherhood that is greater than these differences that separate us. That is a marvelous, wonderful thing. And we should take advantage of that of that, and reject any kind of effort that has been made to try to stigmatize us, to try to separate us, create black churches and white churches and Hispanic churches and all that kind of nonsense. We are one body of believers, and we need to act like one body of believers. And that includes particularly the way that we treat one another. And this goes to the second point, the idea of a barrier of a gap of kindness and being able to overcome that as well. Just because I acknowledge someone as a brother or sister in Christ, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to treat them well. And Jesus says we need to go the extra mile with regard to such things. We need to acknowledge not only that we have famil- uh, family connections, a familial bond with one another, but we also have a bond of genuine love and affection, brotherly love, sometimes it's called. We need to have a way of connecting with one another in a way that is kind and that is real and that is impactful on one another's lives. Now realize, of course, that the differences that exist here in this life ultimately are of no consequence. We're not here to fix society's problems. We're not here even in the church, to fix society's problems. We're not trying to level everybody. This myth of Christian communism that comes up every once in a while is is exactly that, is a myth. When John the Baptist, for instance, says in Luke chapter 3, verse 11, that the one who has two coats he has to give to the one who has none, he does not say on that occasion that the one who has four coats should give one to him who has two. This is not about leveling the playing field. This is not about making us all equal. It's about showing love and compassion to our fellow man and especially to our brethren. That's what we find in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 and following. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Note what is not said in this context. He does not say give until you're not rich anymore. He doesn't say give until there are no poor people people anymore. He says that you have certain resources that are at your disposal. You need to dispose of those in a way that blesses your fellow man. You're not to be greedy. You're not to be covetous. You're not to be higher than now, as it were. We're not to create social statuses inside the church where the the people who matter versus the people who don't matter. We are to act with kindness toward one another at all times. There are always going to be those who have more than other people. That is not America in the 20th and 21st century. That is humanity. In fact, the leveling of the societal playing field, as it were, is is much more effective in America, if you want my historical opinion, much more profound in America than it has been in times past. And certainly in ancient times, there was no leveling. There was no middle class whatsoever. That was not a problem that Jesus addressed. He did not try to eliminate the the lower class, or let me rephrase that, to lift the lower class up to middle class or upper class status. He was not trying to rob the rich people of all their money. 
The only time that came into play was when people like the famous rich young ruler was obviously in a position where his money was interfering with his quest for spiritual things. Those are the ones who are to give everything away and give it to the poor and follow after Jesus. When you cannot follow Jesus with your money, you divest yourself of your money. That's what he's trying to say there. No one can serve two masters. Luke 16 verse 13 tells us that earlier in the passage that we started with there. What we need to do is build this bridge of brotherhood, build this bridge of connection so that we genuinely show affection toward one another. We see one another as family. We interact as family. We share as family would share. That is what love does. That's what Jesus calls us to do. Now, there's another connection that is not made, that could have been made, and it is somewhat different from the others. An absence of, what I'm calling here, an absence of instruction. And we're reading a little bit into the text here. I think it's safe to say that because the rich man is on the wrong side of eternity, he did not have a proper relationship with God. He was not serving God faithfully. And likewise, Lazarus on the right side, on, in Abraham's bosom, he is being protected. He is being graced. He had a relationship with God of some sort. He is in a state of grace. Not because he was poor. That's not the way it works. Plenty of rich people are going to get to heaven. Plenty of poor people are not going to get to heaven. There's no question about that. But whatever Lazarus was not in this life, clearly one thing that he was, was a person who trusted in God. And as such, he had something to offer the rich man that the rich man did not fully appreciate. In fact, he probably didn't think about it at all. He's thinking about it constantly now. He realizes that Lazarus has something to offer, not him because his die is cast, but his family. If he would go back and tell my brothers about this place, perhaps he would motivate them to do what's right instead of doing what's wrong, to oversimplify things a little bit. And Abraham says that's not the way this works, that they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them, which is to say, essentially, God has already communicated his will. He already told them about accountability and about sin and about about consequences. And if they choose to reject that, that's on them. That's not on Lazarus. That's not on Abraham. Uh, that's, That's on the individual. But the acknowledgement that Lazarus has a perspective that presumably, and I don't think this is too much of a reach, he could have shared with the rich man had the rich man been been interested in such things. If he had gone to the the poor man, gone to Lazarus for advice, I realize that that seems kind of silly. At least it must have seemed silly in the moment. I don't doubt that it didn't occur to either of these men that this kind of thing would be advisable in the moment. But now the rich man can't think of anything else. It reminds me a little bit of the story in John chapter 9, this poor man, a beggar, who his entire life was given over to sitting in a public square, begging for help from people who had money because he himself had none and had no opportunity to have anything. He was born blind. And suddenly he could see because Jesus had mercy on him and laid his hands on him and brought healing to him, brought sight to him. And there's profound spiritual points about light and darkness that we don't have time to get into here. The point that I'm trying to make is after the fact, when the religious leaders are having trouble turning this into an opportunity to hurt Jesus, it really seems like an opportunity to build faith in Jesus. That's not what they're interested in. They want to tear Jesus down. So they're trying to look for some kind of opening here. And they bring the formerly blind man in to talk to him about this. And he is... Seems I don't know that he's being a smart aleck, as we would say in our modern day. I don't know that that's the point exactly. But the, the poor formerly blind man seems to be genuinely confused as to why they're having this conversation. And frankly, we are too. It, it doesn't make any sense. I told you already, he says in verse 27, you did not listen. I told you about Jesus before. Why do we want to talk about it again? They respond in verse number 29, we know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. And the man answered and said to them in verse 30, well, here's an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but 
If anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened his, the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were entirely born in sins and you're teaching us. So they put him out. Now, this is a rather simplistic way of looking at righteousness and punishment and reward and grace and power and healing and all of these kind of things, these grand concepts that are dealt with in one level or another, New Testament and Old Testament alike. It's more nuanced than the formerly blind man is letting on here. And I think it's that's fair to say. That being said, the general truth of what he is trying to say, the the third grade logic, if you will, the third grade, third grade Bible class application that he's making here is profound. And clearly, it is greater than the level of understanding that his supposed teachers have. The facts of the matter are undeniable. That's what he can't get past here. How could Jesus not be from God if he's able to heal me? If he did this, he had to have power. The power had to come from God. Therefore, he's from God. Therefore, we need to listen to him. Doesn't that make sense? And, of course, they have no response to that. They're not interested in being lectured by this pauper, by this beggar from off the street. They are the ones with the education. They're the ones with the training. They're the ones with the reputation in the community. It's not appropriate for them to take a Bible lesson from this poor beggar. Unfortunately for them, they were in dire need of exactly that lesson. They were not understanding Jesus at a third grade level, unfortunately. They needed a third grade level lesson. Jesus was frustrated at Nicodemus, remember, in uh, John chapter 3, trying to explain to him the idea of the new birth, and, and seemingly frustrated that Nicodemus could not grasp this. We need to go back to the beginning. We need to start all over again. We need to, to be born again. That's what you need here. These leaders weren't interested in this lesson, and because of that, they miss out on faith. There's a story given along these lines in Ecclesiastes. Uh, maybe this is just a parable that Solomon is telling here. I, I don't doubt, though, that it, this actually happened, that something very much along these lines happened. And Solomon, who was a collector of great stories, ran across the story. Maybe he even knew of it personally. We read in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse number 13, and following, also this I came to see as wisdom under the sun, and it impressed me. There was a small city with few men in it, and a great king came to it, surrounded it, and constructed large siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he delivered the city by his wisdom. Yet no one remembered, no, no one remembered the poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength, but the wisdom of the poor man is despised, and his words are not heeded. The words of the wise heard in quietness are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. What a sad story this is. And how common is this story? The idea that someone from the wrong side of the tracks, if you will, has an insight into how things are done. And when people actually follow him, great things happen. But there's no remembrance because he was the wrong kind of teacher. He was the wrong kind of influence. Uh, he didn't speak with the right kind of voice, the right kind of accent. His skin color was wrong, whatever it happens to have been. He does not get the appreciation, even though he was the one wiser than the supposed wise ones whose responsibility it was in the first place to do the great thing. This poor man does the great thing. He doesn't get the credit. Well, God sees these things, of course, and God will make it right, just like he made it right for Lazarus. There's no question that... In the eternal scheme of things, everything's going to be right. And I strongly suspect that if we wind up pulling up a chair next to Lazarus in the afterlife, we will have forgotten about all of our problems. Lazarus will have forgotten all about his problems. They will not make any difference in the big picture. That should give us confidence, though, in this life. When things do not seem to be working out very well, we believe that God is taking care of us, that he's watching over us, that he will get us through this. I like to believe that Lazarus thought that way, whether you take Lazarus to be a, a, an actual character or a fictitious one, either one, it seems to be a story of faith, although that's not primarily the point of the story. Certainly, he had to have been a person of faith or he wouldn't have been where he was. We, as people here in this life, lean on the Lord, trust in him, believe that he is working these things out for us. And a big part 
of us surviving this life and making it to the afterlife, making it to Abraham's bosom, is believing that there are people along the way, some of whom may not appear on the surface to be qualified, who can help us with this. And the more we can connect to one another, the more we can have fellowship, a real deep-seated spiritual connection with one another, the more equipped we are going to be to handle life's difficulties, to find peace and joy in this life, and find hope for the future. And ultimately, of course, claim the future that Jesus has for us after this life is over. Remembering that inheritance that is undefiled and waiting for us that Peter talks about in First Peter chapter 1. It is reserved in heaven for us. We just have to make it until then. And if we find out that we are not on the right course, that we are in fact headed to the, to the other place in the wrong direction, toward torment, we want to fix that. We want to make that right as quickly as we possibly can. So whether it is for our own sake or whether it is for sake of a brother or sister in the flesh, someone who is not right with God, a brother in Christ who is erring, someone on in the world who has not found the truth, whoever it happens to be, we need to build that bridge while we can. We need to make that connection for our sake, for their sake, for the sake of the cause of Christ. We need to build while we have the opportunity. Again, not to overmake the point, we can't build this bridge in eternity. It is the whole point of the story that you cannot bridge this gap, but we can bridge it now. We can work toward fellowship. We can work toward cooperation. We can work toward a harmony, a harmonious existence uh, among human beings here on this side of eternity, a peace that passes understanding, a fellowship that transcends any kind of social gap that might exist between us. What a wonderful thing it is that Jesus brings us together, that he connects us, he joins us. We become one body, lively stones inside of this spiritual temple built up to offer sacrifices to him. Peter talks about that in 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's take advantage of that. that. Let's connect with the other lively stones in this spiritual facade. Let us draw closer to one another as we collectively draw closer to God and as ultimately, of course, we draw closer to eternity as well. Whatever we can do to help one another along this road, let's do that for our own sake as well as for their sake. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope and pray that this has been a blessing to you and that you can build your own bridges as we go down life's path toward God's things. Thank you and God bless.